you put something on the internet, expect people to come by and try and jiggle the handle and, and, and try and break in. That's going to happen. Either people haven't been learning or we've got new people putting boxes on the internet who just don't know what security is about at all and they know it needs to work and it has to be on the internet for whatever reason, but they haven't understood. And it, it feels like it's, it's like rolling a, rolling a giant stone ball up a hill over and over, if you, you know what I mean. And maybe it, it means better education of the people who are coming up and designing these devices or using these devices as, as enthusiasts at home. I don't know. Jim, so we got a story here about uh, exploit with Samba. You want to give us the rundown on what it looks like? Yeah, this one is uh, kind of disappointing coming so, so recently after the Eternal Blue Wanna Cry stuff that happened recently. Samba is a Linux package that basically allows Linux to behave in Windows networks you know, as a file server or a client using Windows file server or even as an, a domain controller if you want to. Unfortunately, there is a rather nasty bug that appeared in Samba in version 3.5 back in March of 2015. And if you have a writable share. This can be very easily exploited remotely. That's bad enough. But you know, we've seen recently there are a lot of file servers that are exposing port 445 to the internet. And unfortunately, Samba isn't just used on Linux, you know, workstations and servers. Samba is used in a lot of your home NAS network attached storage devices. The bug itself shouldn't be present in most internet facing Linux servers because it's a service that's turned off by default, but it is still going to be present on IoT devices that are specific to sharing files. So, you know, like a, a, a NAS that's running some sort of embedded Linux may have this turned on, unfortunately exposed to the internet. So it is still an interesting wormable bug, something that people should be keeping an eye on and patching. Rapid7, the guys who uh, who do Metasploit, did a scan over the weekend and discovered about 110,000 internet exposed Samba devices. Of those 91%, almost 100,000 of those devices are running an unsupported version of Samba, so a version that doesn't have a patch available for it. There is a workaround if you can't patch it's a one-line config change. It's in the, you know, it's in the articles uh, that are online about this. But uh, this this one could be kind of nasty because you know we talk about it all the time how these IoT devices and these home devices often don't get patched. Well, in this case. Yeah, you you need to find a way to patch your NAS device. So, Jim, you started off by saying that you were actually a little bit disappointed with this bug, and I kind of want to know why. I have read that one of the things that differentiates this from the ones of the Eternal Blue bug that WannaCry was using is that Windows has not Samba but SMB, its Windows equivalent, turned on by default, and most Linux boxes, no IoT storage specific solutions aside, would not have Samba turned on by default. Right, right. And so for most of your, your you know, desktop or server Linux distros, you had to specifically turn it on, and those are going to get patched. It, the, the ones that I'm really worried about are the NAS devices for, you know, aimed at the home users. Right, because they, they end up in the IoT device situation where nobody's really paying attention to them. They're just sort of living their life and, you know, potentially being, you know, manipulated and next thing you know, there's another 445 botnet using all these NAS That's devices. That's the thing is if you've got those attached where they're internet visible, as unfortunately 110,000 of them are, you know, this thing is warmable. This, yep. this is, does not require a human being to do anything other than leave the device exposed to the internet. And for what it's worth, we did take a look and we'll probably go over it in the internet weather too, but okay. the, there is an increase in 445 traffic 
Uh, even with that huge spike that we saw with WannaCry, that was right. a, you know, maybe a one or two day spike and then drop back down. But there's been a significant increase over time. And mm -hmm. we're getting close to levels where that spike was as sort of the, the daily peak. The sustained. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Well, I guess these this may be another area of, of interest now that moving on from 23 or, or maybe peer with two, 23. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, it's not quite up to 23 yet, but... Yeah. To me, it, it bugs me that it's another port like 23 that you think these sort of protocols would have been minimized decades ago. Like right. 445 has been around forever. When yes. Conficker was a big deal, that was the port it was spreading on. Like this seems right. to be a lesson we should have learned already. Right, yeah. yeah these, these should not be exposed to the internet. You shouldn't be allowing 445 to the internet. You know, your home networks should have that blocked. Your enterprises should have that blocked. Nobody should be passing this on the internet. Yeah. Frustrating for sure, but we'll, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out over time. I mean, a little bit of good news is that there are patches, so anybody who's aware of it has a way to sort of, you know, address the issue. So yeah. who's responsible for patching? Who, who cares to patch, you know? And that's when it's, it becomes a real prime target to be part of a, you know, IoT type botnet. So it, that, I think that's the real critical area for this. Checkpoint released um, a document saying that they had found a bug, and it turned out to be several bugs, in a number of different prominent video player applications. So we got a situation where if you enable subtitles on some movie players, we can get into some dicey situations. You want to tell us about that, Matt? Yeah, so this is an interesting one. So Checkpoint put out a blog post, and I think that they had actually reported some bugs before the blog post came out. And in general, they said there's a couple different video player applications, in particular uh, VLC, which is the video LAN client, Kodi, which is sort of, if you, people might know it as XBMC. It's had a long right, history. Yeah. It's one of my favorite players, actually. Uh, Popcorn Time, which is another video player. It has a sort of a history of, of being associated a little bit with piracy, okay. but it's, it's also a very popular player. And uh, there's another one, and the name is escaping. Streamy? Me. Yeah, something like that. Streamio. I Streamio. think the player's called Streamy. Yeah. Or maybe the software, one or the other. And they made it sound like there was a single bug affecting all of these players that had to do with subtitles. Right. And of course, subtitles, you can get them as a separate file. So if you want to watch a movie and it's, it's only in French, you can grab your separate subtitles file and it'll sync it up with the video and play it, which is a pretty helpful feature. It turns out that it's not all one bug. In fact, it's a series of bugs. So Checkmate must have been doing some research in the area of subtitle files, okay. which is a pretty good idea. I mean, if you're looking for bugs, Media players are a great place to start digging for them because they have to handle so many different file types correctly. And I originally thought that subtitles would be the simplest thing in the world. Like the file types that I've seen are like time code on the next line, what's supposed to show up on the screen. But apparently there's a lot of different types of subtitle files and each player seems to handle them differently. Media players are kind of complex and it's hard to get 100% right, but they do have to handle a bunch of different file formats. So the more complexity you have, the, the, the more of a chance there is they're going to find a bug. The whole idea of going after the subtitles is, and in the media players is a, is a fascinating one. Media players need to be able to handle lots of different formats. so there's going to be a lot more opportunity there for potentially some miscoded decoder for the format. We talked about decoders, you know, going back to all the ASN1 bugs, you know, decades ago. And this is just seems like a great grandchild of those now going after the media players. It turns out there's several different bugs. You know, one of the bugs is like a heap overflow, a classic buffer kind of overflow bug. I think it was Popcorn Time was the one that was rendering stuff as HTML, which allowed you to do cross-site scripting, like right. actually put JavaScript in your subtitles and run that, and then use the JavaScript engine to reach to the files. It was very strange. Yeah. And um, there's actually a pretty good uh, discussion of it over on uh, Hacker News, the yeah, Y Combinator site. Yeah, that's where I read about it. Yep, and yeah. they, somebody actually laid out what each bug was, and I found that to be really helpful, because initially, Checkpoint didn't release the contents of those bugs, because the patches hadn't all come out yet. Right, I saw but if, you, that. if you're also the type of person who want to go and read like commit statements in people's you know, GitHub repositories, you can see what the changes are there too. Right. So if you're that kind of, you want to dig into it. I read that, and also in one of them, you can mess with the confidence scoring. So that's, that's interesting. Um, that was just like a, a suspected attack vector. So okay. a lot of these players, you, know, you don't want to go out and dig for these subtitle files yourself, but they'll go to places like opensubtitles.org okay. or whatever, repositories of existing subtitles for known videos. 
But what you can do there is, you know, they'll have four or five different versions of the same subtitle because they're all contributed by a community. So someone may want to play with that algorithm and say, I'm going to get my new malicious, specially right. crafted subtitle file to the top of the ranks so that when people want to watch, I don't know what, some, some French film, right. you know, that shows up as the 100% confident best subtitle version you've got, well, yeah, I'm going to download that one. It'll, you know, be opened up in my player and it'll export the player. So right. that's so it had the the malicious the malware cut in line right to <laughs> exactly yeah it's it's like going in and ranking yourself top on Google Play for some other application that right. you're trying to spoof it's the same kind of reputational attack okay. so it's pretty interesting stuff yeah it seems like there's there's patches already for all of these so people who were running these should obviously go out and patch I know I've already updated my version of Cody so I'm I'm set yeah I have VLC on my machine so yeah I'll, I'll make sure it's patched. Um. Another thing that I think this is an important point that this raises is that a lot of folks think that the only way they can get infected is they download some sort of executable file. Right. But these bugs exist in anything that parses a file. I mean, these are all yeah. file parser bugs. So if you can trick the engine into doing something it shouldn't, it doesn't matter what the content type is as long as it, it has that path that you inject whatever it is your attack is and it makes its way through that code into the, the vulnerable section. So. Right. It shows you that anything that works with files potentially can be exploited. By the way that it goes out to download and read files, you know, there happens to be a vulnerability there. Luckily, the vulnerabilities have all been patched, so if you're using any of these applications, it's time to go and update. All right, let's kick off the weather. It feels like we're starting to see some of these stories, these anecdotes, make their way into the, the scanning and the botnet activity that we're seeing in the network. So it's, it's sort of a thread of activity of not just news stories anymore. Now, you know, we're seeing the activity either before there's a news story or we'll see something we talk about in the news make its way into, you know, evidence on the network. So I think that's been really interesting from my perspective. Most probe ports, not a lot of surprise here at the top, is still port 23. I think it's going to be there for the rest of my life. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> number two is port 1433 TCP, which is, I believe, is MySQL server, which is okay. interesting. And you had said you saw something last yeah, week. Yeah, we did a story, I don't know if it was last week or the week before, about BondNet, which was a botnet that one of the attack vectors was MySQL. There was a number of them. So I wonder if maybe that's related. I'm, we'd have to check in further. It's possible. Yeah, it's a heck. It's, it's had quite a, quite a change up. 11 spots in the last week. It's a good run. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Port 22 comes in after that, which is SSH. Not much of a surprise there. Port 1900 UPnP, again, is we see that pretty frequently up towards the top. Uh, port 9000 TCP is actually super interesting. That just showed up in the last day or so on our radar. Although, um, from what I've heard, there's been some activity in the past week, but we'll go into that a little bit more. Uh, number six is 80 TCP. Web traffic is always somewhere in the top 10 in my experience. 3389 is remote desktop protocol. 445 is uh, Samba SMB, which is actually kind of interesting in light of the WannaCry attack, so we'll go into that a bit. Good. Port 123 UDP is network time protocol, NTP. We see that being used a lot for reflective denial service attacks. And port 1911 is that Niagara AX HVAC control system. Okay. Um, and that one actually, it looks like it's gone up quite a bit in the last week, but I think maybe I'm not so worried about that. that that's been in our top 10 before, and the majority of that scanning is a known research organization keeping okay. an eye on that port. Uh -huh. So I'm not as concerned with that one, but you know, it's it has changed quite a bit, so Volume-wise, significant. So most sources probing, which again, this is more of a, how many bots are interested as opposed to how much volume we're seeing. Okay. Uh, port 23, again, is at the top. Hasn't changed at all since last week. Yeah. 445 is in second place, which is, again, probably related to that eternal blue, same bug that the WannaCry um, worm has been using. Uh, port 81 is back up towards the top. And I think we've seen that as well uh, related to the Purser I bought right, that. Yeah. Um, that one has had a significant change in the last week, so maybe that's been jumping up and down. Not sure why, but number four is port 22. Again, usual, usual top contender. 53, 58, that's a good question. I think we've seen that one related to the Hajime botnet. Okay. Uh, I believe that's one we've seen before. Port 9000 TCP is interesting, and we'll go into that in a bit. 80 TCP, again, is web. The ICMP ones are not typically that interesting. Sometimes backscatter, sometimes other things. Right. Uh, and port 21 TCP is actually a little bit interesting. Uh, I believe that one is FTP. Yeah. So some FTP going on this week. So just to go into more detail on port 81. So we saw the Perseri botnet come up about a month ago. Right. And you can see that initial spike there around the 9th. 
And I believe it was initially sinkholed by researchers and then it sort of fell off the map. Yeah, they parked the domains. We, That's right. We went into this a few times and yeah, they, they, for some reason they parked the domains and then we saw that right before it peaked here on 81, it actually was some scanning on 82, which was interesting. So okay. this is definitely something that's it's a new thing, and now we're probably seeing it sort of sustain over time. Yeah, so. it's a definitely an interesting pattern for these. Yeah. Usually you see these you know, upticks and then a coordinated drop-off means the botnet's all acting in a coordinated fashion. Right. You see these interesting plateaus up here, and this yeah. is... It's a different pattern than what I'm used to seeing, and I'm having a hard time explaining exactly what's going on there. But right, yeah, I, I mean, there, me there seem to be some devices with some, uh, you know, particular storage, you know, and uh, you know, one of these private database type things running that that they're exploiting. It seems like on this okay. uh, port. So it's maybe it's supposed to be an alternate port 80, but it's. Mm -hmm. you know, pretty dormant port, but all of a sudden, you know, yep. you start seeing the scanning, you know some sort of botnet activity is going on. Sure. Pretty interesting stuff. Yeah. It may just be copycats, people who, are, you know, had read about it in the news and said, that sounds like an interesting attack vector, why don't I do that? Could be someone else had rebooted the Perseri botnet and is, is using different command and control that hasn't been taken over by researchers. I haven't got hard details on exactly who is doing it, but we certainly know that the interest in that port has gone up significantly. Probably another ongoing botnet that we're going to have to keep our eyes on moving forward. Port 9000, like I said, in the last really, I think, 24 to 48 hours is when this kicked off. And the suspicions and the rumblings that I'm hearing, this is related to a very specific brand of DVR okay. um, that it uses port 9000 and has a couple of vulnerabilities that have been around for a while. Uh, the sources appear to be mostly IoT devices from what I spot checked. Okay. Just taking a look in our own data and in Shodan to see what ports are open. And a lot of it was very, you know, IoT-ish. The okay. sorts of ports and the sorts of banners I was getting back. So to me, this feels more like a, an IoT botnet looking for more IoT-specific vulnerabilities to find an exploit. So someone may be going back through the back catalog of old IoT bugs mm. and trying them out one by one. Uh, but this is pretty interesting. Uh, yeah. That's a really significant bump in the number of scanned sources per hour. So I'd love right. to see more. It about almost this. reminds me of what we did see initially with port 81. Is that you know out of nowhere, a uh, kind of relatively unknown, unused port, and then you know maybe in two weeks from now we'll be talking about some named botnet on port 9000. So yeah. who knows? My take on it right now is that it's an IoT botnet looking for other IoT vulnerabilities, uh, ones that haven't been really scanned for before. Potentially, we'll see some maybe a new named botnet. Um, on that port 9000, but really this is the start of it. So we saw it in the network and it'll be interesting to track what happens moving forward. So port 445, you know, we, we know this from the WannaCry attacks. 445 really never went away. I mean, Conficker was the big botnet for a while, but people have always been interested in scanning on it. But ever since the, that WannaCry worm that came out that used the 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 eternal blue vulnerability, right. ever since then, the interest has been slowly gathering on that port because they know it's an effective bug. And there's been a couple other different malware families that have been trying to use that to right. try and break in. Um, but it's pretty consistent. You can see back down here, start of the month, coming in around you know, eight to 10,000 scan sources per hour. But now our, our floor is around yeah. 12 with a daily cycle. So that's, yeah. Port 445 continues to be a port of interest. Um, we saw the WannaCry worm come out earlier this month. We saw a significant spike at that point, but even past that, we see increasing cycles, daily cycles of people scanning for this port. Real interesting evolution of, you know, a spike of scanning during the WannaCry incident that now is, it's more of a sustained scanning, uh, probably some sustained botnet activity that we expect to increase over time that, uh, you know, we'll probably be facing in the network for the, for the foreseeable future. You know, we're now, seeing almost equal to the peak of WannaCry is sort of almost a sustained yeah. scanning. I would so say within within a couple of days, maybe even maybe a week or so, we'll probably see that as the peak every single day. Crazy. So, right, yeah. well. uh, Port 1433, which we, we've seen before in the last couple of weeks, has actually had a significant amount of activity. But what I thought was particularly interesting is that today of all days, it looks like that traffic has started to drop off significantly. And I don't have an explanation for it. Hopefully it has something to do with the dismantling or, or disruption of a botnet. Okay. Um, but you know, for the last, let's say that's the 25th to the 30th, the last five days, it really has almost, I was on a ballpark, it almost tripled in wow. that time uh, and then going back down. Huh. So yeah, 
And then just to do another review of port 23, because it's still the number one. Right. Um, hasn't been that much movement up and down in the last couple of, uh, couple of days. Couple yeah, I mean, weeks. I think we had thought it might tail off a little more than it seems to have, you know, didn't. But I guess when you're still recruiting bots on 23, nobody ever seems to take care of them. So. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, I, I wonder if it has to do with the saturation at this point. Of right. Has, has every single vulnerable bot been taken over? Right. Vulnerable machine, I mean. But I, I wonder if what, what causes that kind of interest there. I mean, to me, my first guess would be that some device out there that hadn't been publicly known to have a, a simple username and password might have been discovered, and then you have more interest. There's a new heard to or maybe even the I don't know if this is the same time as the wanna cry but as sort of you know interest in scanning in general becomes more with you know wanna cry being almost like a public phenomenon maybe there's more scanning on on all the ports during that time I don't know I think wanna cry came in around uh, okay. the 15th here so, uh, so that be peak is around 9th and 10th oh, never I mean <laughs> yeah I mean it, I saw it too and I, I decided I had, to, I had to make sure that that wasn't some sort of coordinated scanning on both 23 and right but yeah it's 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 kind of interesting that it happened within days of the other one okay we're seeing some of the stories that we talk about start to make their way into the weather so, you know, we talked about port 445 today and we saw that with the Samba story. We talked about the Perserai botnet and we saw that on port 81 in the weather. There's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of devices out there that are exposing ports that really should no longer be a problem. And I, I don't know who to, we need to talk to to teach them that these are basic things that we've learned as a security community. Things like Telnet, things like Port 445 and the whole Samba suite. We need to be able to reach out to other people who are in involved with the creation and, and maintenance of these devices and, and shake them a little and, and say, we've learned the lessons, we want to make sure that you've learned them too.